want to take a second to allow our children, ages three to six, to be dismissed. If you have a child in that age range, we have a, a ministry called Resurrection Junior where the same passage and ideas are going to be taught at a preschool level. We know uh, there, there's, there's benefits on both sides of life. Children worshiping with and watching their parents is, is one way that we're shaping, discipling, and bringing along our children. And then we also know that, that uh, I'm hard to understand sometimes, so we want the kids to get something. And we try to teach them at another level. Everyone's asleep. Okay. So, or it's a bad joke. There's two options, right? That, um, we, we want to see these little ones grow up in the faith. One of the dreams I have as a pastor is the hope of handing off the church to somebody that has grown up right here. That would be a joy. So let's, let's not forget the eternal and also even in the next couple decades, beauty of pouring into these little ones. If you would like to serve in that, come along, all right? I want to make a, a plea. You know, the, the pastors, Pastor Richard, Pastor Brian, and myself, we were having a, a good discussion earlier this week about the needs of the life of our church, and I just thought, you know, I need to talk about this with our church. It's been, it's been a rough year, right? It's been a, a rough 14 months for staying together as a church. People in this room are feeling disconnected. If we're honest, even the most connected of us feel less connected than ever before. There's a million reasons. Not only in the history of our church do we have this merge where we're relatively new together, but in the history of the world, we had this pandemic that kept us separate from each other. There's all these different reasons why many people in this room are feeling a little bit close to E on fellowship. And then here's this other trick. Getting people in large numbers into the same room has some risks, okay? So, so what's happening is, as, a, as leaders, it's hard to be helping you get together. But we're also deeply in need of each other. And right now, I don't know how the math works on how to solve that, but I'm going to start by saying, hey, would you just walk across the room and ask someone how they're doing? Would you just take the step to fill an evening this week with one family in your living room or around your dinner table? Or grab a pizza and tell them, surprise, we're showing up. We brought dinner to your living room. Okay? And if, they, if they're mad, you blame it on me. But here's the thing. No one in every category of life drifts into excellence. There's this scientific principle about entropy. Things go and they decay, right? Well, take relationships. They will not slide into deep and meaningful relationships. People will not slide into community, stumble and fall into deep friendships that are centered on Jesus. It's not going to happen. And so some of you in this room I want you to hear me calling because I know you're mature believers and calling you to say, I'm going to walk across the room and grab somebody else and say, I'm not letting go till you bless me. <sighs> this is stupid. I'm going to put somebody on, on the spotlight and I didn't intend to, he'll forgive me. Okay, but Abby and Emily are friends and Nathan and I are kind of friends, but I told somebody the other day that it was kind of like this. I just said, I'm not letting go till we're friends. Okay, because I'm hard to get along with. And we're not the same. He's a lot more level-headed. I'm just going to be Nathan's friend. I've decided, okay? So this is the way it goes. It's just some of you are that person, and some of you are the other person. That's like, get off me. Push a little less, grab a little more. Whichever personality you are, we need to come together, okay? We need to make sure, because isolated sheep are in danger, souls without God uses the gift of meaningful friendships, spiritual relationships. The Puritans, as much as they're not, they're, they're other humans, they're not perfect, but they had this category for this thing called conferences that they tried to encourage. Now, they didn't mean get a celebrity speaker and get people to all come sit and watch the front. What they meant was conversations 
as pastors, they were talking, how do we stir up the right kind of conversations that knit people together around Jesus? I know you know how to talk about the Lions. I know you know how to talk about Michigan football. I know you know how to talk about those things. But, but what, what I'm deeply asking you to do now is take that step that feels like you might die to ask how someone else's soul is doing. Because I think the Spirit will meet you there, and we need it. All right? Sermon over. Not the real sermon. Just that sermon, okay? I'll preach to you twice today. But I love you, and I want this for you, because I'm watching as different people say in their own ways, I don't feel connected enough, all right? And it's a hard time to connect. Let's acknowledge it and lean into the Spirit and see what he does, okay? Um, would you turn in Luke chapter 6? Luke chapter 6, Pastor Brian's going to come, and he is going to read verses 17 to 26, and then, uh, and then I'm going to come and open this with you. Luke 6, 17. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. And looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we're here to hear the words of your Son that, while spoken thousands of years ago, still ring true today from your living word. And we're so grateful that we have here um, Jesus' reminder to us that with him, as Troy's already said, with him we have everything, no matter our circumstance here on earth. Um, and we're so grateful and so thankful that we have on display here your Son's power and majesty over all forms of creation over all forms of maladies and, and pains and trials, but his reminder to us that it's with him that we have everything, that, that there is no pain of earth that heaven can't heal, that there is an eternality to our lives and to our actions and to our thoughts, and that while you may heal a, a pain or, or a worry that we have, that really it's, it's, it's us having you that gives us everything. And maybe walk out of that fact, may we, may we live our lives in the freedom that we've sung about that you've won on our behalf. We'll give you all the praise and glory. Help Pastor David to take these words and, and, and instruct us and show us how to look at Jesus again and marvel at his work. In Jesus' great name, amen. amen. All right. <clears throat> if you'd keep your Bibles open there, I'm going to get a quick drink here. I, uh, I want to take you through this passage. We've been running as a kid, I grew up, uh, I really enjoyed the Roadrunner and the Wiley Coyote, right? And they, they would fight each other, and Tom and Jerry, same thing, whatever. The, uh, the, the pace we've been running reminded me of the, the Roadrunner, who would all of a sudden, what we're going to do in this passage is stop on a dime and look over, because I want us to slow down and think about what Jesus is teaching his disciples, and what he's going to be teaching us is what the good life is which I think almost everybody in here has an interest in. in. On Instagram, there are people that you follow who are posting pictures that say a thousand words about a dream of the good life, the way it should or could be. There are people posting uh, videos on, on, on YouTube and people sharing on Facebook, but not, not just on our phones are we seeing pictures of the good life. We're sharing 
kind of an imagination of the good life with maybe our friends, what we, we talk about and where we're hoping, you know. And so, so one friend gets a camper, and then another friend wants a camper, and then they all start to camp together. Or, or maybe it's a, a place up north, or maybe it's a, a, a tradition in the year. We share these imaginations about the good life. I think, you know, the hashtag goals. What are Jesus' descriptions of the good life? Look at the, the, the passage. He's called together the apostles. There are other disciples rallying around him. And they're particularly, remember last week, people who have one thing in common. They are desperate. And that's all that defines them is they're desperate and they cast themselves on Jesus. In fact, anybody who's not desperate doesn't anybody who's not sick doesn't come to the doctor. Anybody who doesn't know they're a sinner doesn't come in need of a savior. But people are rallying to Jesus who have a major problem and they need him to solve it. And they know life isn't good. And then you look in this passage and it says that after Jesus calls these apostles, this foundation of the new community that he's forming, there's a great number of people from all over coming. Verse 18, they come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they're troubled by impure spirits and, and they're cured. People are trying to touch him and he's healing them all. There is power enough in Jesus to transform their problems. And they're thinking the good life may be just upon us. So let me say another word, a little more Bible word. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom has arrived. God's king has come to save, purify, and restore. And things are actually getting better. And then Jesus looks at the disciples around him, and he gives his vision of the good life. And it is not what you'd expect. See, blessed, when Troy read Psalm 1, he was reading a passage that in the Bible we would call uh, wisdom literature. It's, let me tell you how the way of the world works in God's economy, how he built it. Sometimes we read the word blessed or blessed and we think this is an instruction manual like Leviticus or, or something like that, like a law. You do this, do this. But I want you to think Jesus is, is stepping up and saying, okay, if I'm God's son sent to save and I'm here with all God's power and authority, let me tell you the way I see living right in God's world, the way I see flourishing under God, the way I see the good life. Now, in Matthew, he only says the blessings, not because... These are at odds with each other, but because Jesus taught many times in many places, and Matthew and Luke and Mark and John select certain portions of Jesus' teaching to make a specific point. Here, Jesus is recorded not just saying, here's what's the good life, but also, here's how to ruin your life. Warnings. Woes. And when we look at them, right, they are not what we would expect. The good life versus heading for calamity gets a little scary. Look at the words. Who's living the good life? Blessed are you who are poor. Verse 21, you who hunger now. You who weep now. When people hate you. The people who have life figured out are the poor. That's what he's saying. That's what, that's what the verse is describing. The people who have life figured out are those who are hungry and rejected. The people who need to take a warning 
if I can use my own translation here, right? Verse 24. The people who need to, like, catch the wind and go, oh, oh, oh I, need to, I need to change course here, are the rich and the well-fed and those who laugh and who are approved by everyone. Now, let's be honest, okay? That is confusing. If you're not confused, then you come up here. <laughs> because I'm confused when I start going down this road. I'm going, what? Nobody... Usually, I'm sure there's an Instagram account out there, but you know what? There's not lots of us following Instagram accounts of deformities and diseases and suffering and sorrow. The things we want to scroll through are not physical abnormalities and poverty and affliction and funerals. It's not what's on our imagination. The, 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 the stories we share, we don't tell each other, oh, you know, somebody says, well, they got a camper. Maybe we should think about getting a camper. They don't say, well, they got cancer. Maybe we should think about getting cancer. We know we want to go away from those things. We want to run from those things. That's what our heart's telling us. And Jesus is saying, let me tell you about the good life. The good life, who's living the good life? It's the poor. It's the hungry. And we don't understand. In fact, if you're willing to be honest with me, I'll be honest with you. We don't want this to be true, <laughs> right? Okay, we want Jesus to be misunderstanding something or maybe just talking so far back then that we really have some kind of mystery we can pull out of the hat and say, see, he didn't mean it. He didn't mean it. <laughs> Thank God he didn't mean it because we're well fed and I love food. Don't nod your head like that, Charity. She knows I love food. Okay, so we didn't mean it. No, he did mean it. Jesus measures life, and here's why. Here's how, we're gonna, how, how are we going to bring this together? We're going to understand him. Life is longer than we think. The good life is measured beyond our normal ruler. And that's key to understanding Jesus. Because Jesus measures life in a longer time frame than we do, we have to recognize that he is looking ahead. Do you see in the verse? It doesn't just say, blessed are the poor now. It says something very crucial again and again and again. You will, or yours will be, or is, in the, in the future coming ahead, you will laugh. You see, Jesus isn't some kind of um, confused human who thinks that it's enjoyable to mourn. And you can see that in the passage when he says, well, you might be mourning now, but you will eventually laugh. Jesus knows that laughter is a good gift from God. He's not some kind of like, let me just punish myself. Jesus knows that being well-fed is not like, it's, it's not worse. You'd rather be fed than be hungry and he knows that, but, but the timing is crucial. He says, you will be fed. You will receive your reward. And, and, and what's crucial is this. He knows one portion of life, the portion after the day of reckoning, the timeline after your death or the return of the Son of Man is a lot longer and more permanent than this experience now. And that's why I'm telling you, he's sitting there like Proverbs and saying, it would be a bad bet to try and get it all now because now's a lot shorter than then. You feel me? Now's a lot shorter than then. Lay up, as he tells us in the scriptures, your treasures where it won't run out, where it can't rust, and it can't be stolen. And maybe you felt this year in a way more pronounced and more profound than you've ever felt before. This life is not as reliable or long-lasting or permanent as I, than I, as I thought it was. And that's crucial to understanding what Jesus is trying to tell us. The good life... Is not some kind of reversal where you intentionally punish yourself. It's just putting your hopes in blessings that last. It's betting on the time and place that will truly endure. Because I believe this is like a central defining attribute of our, like, of our struggle of faith. 
You ever hear somebody talk about like, well, that's future David's problem, right? Usually we joke around about that because that's a sign that they're not being wise, right? When they go, oh, that's a problem for me tomorrow. You're like, well, you, if you either die or tomorrow you get there and you're gonna go, why did I wait, <laughs> right? <laughs> why did I ignore this? But, but we, I know that we're joking around often when we say that's a problem for future Joe. But, but Jesus is trying to help us recognize that there definitely is a future you. And he wants you to live a good life, the good life, the life that God defines that won't go, it's been pretty good now, and then the problems are permanent. He wants you to embrace God's plan now so that the blessings will be permanent. And that's where we have to push to try and understand here. So what is he simply meaning? Is he simply meaning that you should kind of take some twisted approach to win God's favor by, by punishing yourself? Some kind of trust in me righteousness that is punish me righteousness? I just need to be poor and I need to eat less, which is true, but in the wrong way. You know, like just, just be, I need, to, I need to do these things that make life hurt because God will see how much life hurts and then he'll save me because of my willingness to punish myself. That is not what Jesus is describing. He is not describing some kind of works righteousness slum righteousness. And I think that he, even in the way he talks, gives us the centerpiece of how we can tell that. Because look at the verses in 23, 22. You're blessed when you're just, he doesn't say just when you're just rejected. You're rejected because you chew with your mouth open and everybody can't stand to sit near you at the table. No, that's not what, that's not what, so slap your gums. No, that's not what he's saying. He says, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of who? The son of man, because of him. And he makes a key illustration of people that have gone ahead and proved out his logic. He doesn't point to a bunch of poor people specifically. Who does he point to? Verse 23, rejoice in that day, he tells you, and leap for joy because your reward, great is your reward in heaven. For that is how, here's, here's your illustration in front of you. Their ancestors treated who? The prophets who had lined themselves up with God at the cost of their lives right now. They were persecuted in the history of Israel. They suffered and were rejected. And ultimately, the headaches Moses endured during 40 years in the wilderness were 40 years. And he's been in glory for some five, three, five thousand, whatever. Like, right? He's been... It's been okay. He got through that 40 years in the wilderness with these stubborn, stupid people who didn't want to listen to him, did want to challenge him, and really didn't want to follow him. And because he had cast his lot in with the Lord and said, I will, I will listen to the Lord, this prophet, though rejected and struggling and frustrated in this life, has now been blessed. And when you join... Moses will still be there. He's like, oh, yeah, let me show you around. I've been here for 3,000 years, and you're both going to be there for the rest. Jeremiah spent his time in a pit, rejected for what he preached, plots against his life. Josh talked from Jeremiah a couple, couple weeks back. Jeremiah's been doing okay for the last couple thousand years. And Jesus is trying to help us get real wisdom and see the world the way it really works. If Jeremiah had said, I want to get out of this pit right now, I take it back. God didn't really say all those things I said. It would have been a bad deal. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us about the good life. Don't measure it so short. Life is way longer than you're tempted to think. Because of the Son of Man really is that central and defining phrase. Because who does he give? The false prophets who didn't line themselves up with the truth of God or the Son of God. They, they said what lined up with the moment and age and didn't have any problem doing that. It would be really easy for me to promise to you all the hopes of God in this life and all of your problems solved in this life. Not many people would be frustrated with me because we want our problems solved, right? So there's, this is not merely about being poor, 
or about it's about staking your claim with Jesus. That's what that's what I think he's saying right now to them at the center of this is the good life fundamentally comes with casting yourself on Jesus, as we've seen so far. It comes with lining yourself up with Jesus. But here's where we can all feel like, oh, I popped the balloon that was hanging over us, where you have to be poor to be a Christian, and nobody else wants to be poor or hungry or sick. And so we're all like, good, thank God he let me out from under that burden. Now let's close the sermon down. I realize I don't have to be convicted anymore. I can just go on my merry way. But I don't think that's what actually Jesus is doing. He is saying something. That's the normal perspective for the New Testament. And it's hard for us to recognize that. But Paul says this, 2 Timothy 2, 3. In fact, everyone who wants to lead, live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Matthew 10, the Lord says, whoever does not take up their cross. A symbol of what again? A brutal murder. And follow me is not worthy of me. And whoever tries, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Acts chapter 14, the first disciples, as they're walking through the early stages of the life of the church, they strengthen the disciples in the missionary advance of the gospel, and they're encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And here's the words they say. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. John 15, Jesus says these words in verse uh, 15. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, and that is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. That They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Later in John 16, 33, you know what he says? I have told you these things so that in me you have peace. May have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Do you know, maybe, you know, as a, as a young boy, there were a few movies that were always kind of like allowed when we had friends over. My dad was very, a short selection of movies we could watch with somebody else's children. Star Wars. Indiana Jones 1 and 2, not Temple of Doom because of that weird, like, all right? And then Rocky 3 and 4. Clubber Lang has a prediction that's like Jesus' prediction in Rocky 3. Pain. That's the prediction for your Christian life. Do you realize that? Pain. (laughs) That's what Jesus says is coming. In this world, you will have pain. But that's not what we want to hear, is it? Jesus looks at his group of disciples and says, the people who cast their lot with me, it will be the good life eternal from an eternal perspective. But right now, they're most likely going to be poor, hungry, rejected. And we're like, what in the world is going on? Suffering is the norm for a crucified Messiah's followers before the glory that he guaranteed and will bring. Predicted Jesus predicted this and welcomes us to join us. Now, here's what happens, okay? I, I've been wrestling with this passage for years, but, but what I think comes up in my heart often is we all go, well, yeah, don't, boy, thank God we live in America, and this is the unique, the most unique setting in the history of the world to be a Christian, and none of that applies to us. Isn't that awesome? Right? We all think, well, good thing this, te- this passage has no teeth because nobody 
is going to ever hate us for Jesus. Nobody's ever going to, you know, it's never going to cost me anything. And the more I have meditated on that thought in my heart, that we have freedoms and prosperity, and, and we could never fathom that this passage is applying to us because of our situation is so unique. But I actually wonder, I mean, do we feel like the world is a friend to grace? Do we really feel like right now the normal disposition to Jesus over everything is approval? The normal posture of people to God is that they love him? The normal heartbeat for the things around us is to worship God? No. So then why do we feel like it's such a unique setting? Because here's what... This, I'm just going to ask some tough questions that I've had to ask myself. So if this past year you have spent more on consumer debt, you have spent more money you didn't have to get things that you just want for you than you've given to the Lord, can you really say you're not poor because you've cast all with Jesus and it's, it's been costly but I'm just prosperous? Or are you just a rich, self-indulgent person that needs to hear a woe? Woe to you, rich, who decided to have your pleasure now, Jesus says. Let's just be real. If you have spent more money going out to eat than you have given to those in need, all of us all go, oh, oh, crap. (laughs) Is it because we're like, oh, I've cast all in the eternal hopes that the Son of Man brings, or is it because we're actually just kind of self-centered in a world that is hostile to God. We just have ways of explaining it based on American prosperity. Like, no, 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 no. We don't have to suffer here because it's unique. And that's why I haven't told my coworkers about Jesus because they might reject me because it's unique or because in the minor places, we are in the most prosperous time in history in the most prosperous place ever. I get that. But in the little things, like like walking across to the cubicle where you might be rejected for telling somebody about Jesus, when we say, I'd rather be accepted, it'd be hard for me to think that the reason we're well-liked is because of the historical moment. It'd be hard for me to think that the reason I have tons of prosperity is because I know Jesus says, I put my hope in eternity, I I'm so loose-handed and open-handed with the things of this life that when I see someone in need, I don't just give them my coat, I give them my shirt too. I'm listening to Jesus. I believe that. He's going to say it in the next passage. He's going to say, if you encounter someone who's needy, give it. But you know what goes on in our hearts? Well, wait, wait a second. I'd be poor then. Well, then you wouldn't have to be concerned about this whole confusing part of the passage, would you? You'd go, oh, I'm poor, and I can look to eternity. (laughs) But instead, what what do we do? We tell ourselves, well, they don't deserve it. I need it. I need to stay rich, but I have to figure out how Jesus still has blessing for me in the future. Because our hearts are playing a dangerous game that Jesus warns us in when he says... The thing that grows up and chokes out the word, hardship, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things, the comforts of being accepted instead of rejected for the Son of God, the comforts of being protected by our own budget, enjoying our own things instead of suffering the hardship of pouring out our lives for him and for others, they they climb up and they choke out the word. And what happens in our hearts is we would rather figure out a way that this passage isn't giving us a warning about our current life circumstance. And also not take Jesus seriously to cast all our hopes in his future that he's bringing. Uh, No, 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 Jesus, let's figure out a way that I'm getting the future blessing, but I also just have a really wonderful, comfortable life. I never have to share the gospel and get rejected. I never have to give to somebody till it hurts. I never have to lay up my treasure anywhere. Can I I lay up my treasure here and get, get, get heaven? Man, Jeremiah would have loved that deal, right? Moses would have loved that deal. We'd all love that deal. But Jesus is saying, who are you betting on? 
are you going to actually cast your lot? Now, I, again, remember, I'm not saying the solution for you is to kind of work your way into God's pleasure by, by somehow mechanically making yourself poor. But let's be honest, we put a lot more energy into staying rich than we do thinking, my hope is in Jesus. We can do that. There's a reason, there's, there's a reason in our hearts that's trying to te- reach up and choke out the gospel that we want to stay quiet in the few and far between places that we might suffer rejection for his name. I know everybody's up in arms about the future when, when Orthodox Christianity is going to face persecution, but honestly, I just want you to think right now about the reason you're quiet with the person you know their name and their story and you know they don't trust Jesus. Because that rejection right there is a place where Jesus is wondering which life is the good life to you truly. Are you listening to me? You can, you, I will get you through the rejection now to the glory that, to, that is to come. When a need is presented to you in your body of believers or in some other place, and you go, well, yeah, I know they need this, but I need this too, and I was really hoping for another car or another vacation or another. There's a battleground going on about who has our hearts and where our hope is located. And Jesus says, The good life is not measured between birth and death. It's measured between birth and eternity. Don't put your bet on this life. Put your bet on me. And so some of us are going to have more financial resources. And some of us are going to have more friends. And some of us are going to have more food. And I get that. And I am not looking at you and thinking, who's got money? Who's well-fed? Who's got friends? You're all bad people. I'm asking you to look inward and go, have I been kidding myself that it's just the circumstances of history that have me protected from suffering for Jesus? Or have I been protecting myself from the suffering that comes in following and pouring my life out for Jesus? Now, if you, if I'm just preaching to me, that's okay. Because I needed this passage. The good life comes to those who wait on Jesus, who bet on Jesus, who trust in Jesus. But it's eternal. And seeking the good life here and now will destroy your life. Those who try to keep it will lose it. Those who give it up will save it. He will save it. But the, but the, the thing I don't want you to do is go out the door and go, all right, I've got to do better. I'm going to save me by doing this better. Underneath the actions that you probably need to take in response to this passage is actually going to be a decision about where your hope is put. And that's what I want you to do, is not go, oh, I must be poor, so let me just empty my bank accounts and do the LeBron James with a bunch of money out in the street. Throw it up in the air and just watch it blow in the wind. No, no, no. I want you to decide who is going to deliver the good life to me, and then, by God's grace, say out loud, it's Jesus. When is he going to deliver the good life? It's eternally. And then talk to God by his spirit and say, this is hard. I don't, I don't want, if you're willing to be honest, maybe you're not like I am, but I go, ooh, I don't want to know what it's going to look to live like this. I want to find the reasons why I don't need to, when someone asks me for their coat, give them my shirt too. I want to figure out the ways where following Jesus won't be really, really costly. Can we, can we talk about that in the sermon? How this doesn't apply that much? Not go, Holy Spirit, will you help me to have a heart that is truly betting on Jesus for the good life? Enough that when it costs and hurts, I'm willing to take the steps to follow him, to trust him, to speak for him that the prophets took. Because I can see the reward that the prophets gained through him. I can see that truly the good life is not just in this moment here and now. What what I'm hoping for us is to be so trusting of Jesus, the Son of God, that we will wait and live and invest in the future that he is bringing, that we will set our hopes on that which is eternal. 
And if God decides that you are wildly financially blessed and you get to spend your entire life saying, I want to invest in that which is eternal by giving to the glory of God and to the good of others, great. Remember, this is not about a mechanical, where do I line up in the economy of the world? It is about where have I placed my hopes for the delivery of the world? And it has to be Jesus alone. May we not be the kind of people who make more plans to, to eat out than to alleviate the hunger. Is it, do we really feel like the suffering around the world? Yeah, yeah, Red Robin has a billboard, but... I don't know any pain. I know where the restaurants are, right? I don't know any places where I could be painfully for the good of somebody else. I only know the places where I can feed me. I don't think that's true of us. But I think we have to, it's a hard work of faith to hear Jesus say, the good life would be not ignoring the suffering around you. It would be pouring yourself out because you have hope in me to deliver you. Jesus is the one who will deliver the good life to us. Seeking it here and now will destroy us. May God help us to have eyes of faith. Let's pray. Father, this can be heavy for us to wrestle with, but I pray, Holy Spirit, that this would be unavoidably clear that we are only hoping in Jesus, not our ability to give to charity or feed the hungry. We may be led by you to move to the needs of others, but Lord Jesus, please rid every heart of any hope in our own actions. Put our only hope in you. But then, Lord Jesus, please give us eyes of faith that can live for the future you're bringing and not for the enticements of a comfortable, successful, applauded life now. In a room this big, Lord Jesus, there are going to be some people in this current time of history who are wealthy and who are well-fed and well-liked. And I pray that they would take that with, with the heart to pour it out and use it for you. And in a room this big, there are people who are suffering, rejected, and hungry. And I pray that they would hope in you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.